All right, thank you, Josh. And we couldn't be more enthusiastic about having an incredible guest on our podcast today, Mr. Bob Clouser. Bob, thanks for being on the podcast. Oh, thank you for asking me. Yeah. I thought I was too old. No, no, this is <laughs> right in your wheelhouse. And so I'm excited. And, um, you know, it's obviously a great honor to have us have you on our show. And uh, we get a ton to cover here because I know our listeners want to know all about your history, number one, the history of the Clouser Minnow. And kind of what you're up to these days, we want to talk about a few of those things because you have this great heritage in fly fishing that we want to preserve and we want to make sure that all these, you know, I interviewed Braid, Braden Miller yesterday, he's a 14-year-old young man. Actually, oh, you know this guy. Oh, oh, yeah, you bet. He's with TFO, right? He's a youth yep. ambassador yep. with TFO. And yep. Wonderful young man. He, Wonderful young Yeah, man. great young man. And, and we want to talk about the Clouser Minnow because, I mean, everyone wants to know how it was created, why it was created, maybe how to some pointers on how to tie it better. And obviously that what you're up to, you know, what you're doing these days. We want to hear about what's going on with Mr. Bob Clouser. So, again, thanks for being on the show. Yeah. Right now, with what's going on with me, I'm still fishing. Yes, sir. And I love it, and I'm never going to get out of it. But you ask about the minnow, and, of course, I'm from Pennsylvania, and we have two super sports when I was a young man. One of them was smallmouth bass on the Susquehanna River, and the other has been the trout uh, realm in Pennsylvania. And I love to fish, and when... When our trout fishing was over, uh, we fished from October until sometimes the middle to end of June for trout. And after, after that, we had the Bass River to go on. And I loved the fly fish, and I developed a lot of flies for the trout fishing over the years. And But I didn't have anything really that I could call a super bass fly. Yeah. And when you look back at things and, and the way we fish with kids with spinning gear, uh, the fly is not a jig, but the way the jig was king. And I was wondering how and why it caught so many fish. And I found out that it had weight and it went to the bottom and it acted like an escaping bait fish. Okay. I wanted to incorporate that into a fly. And we tried numerous things. Uh, I had, uh, I guess, a pre-Clouser minnow, which we couldn't sell because we couldn't put eyes on it and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But we had, had to hook weighted. And uh, Smucker, that owned uh, Wapsy Fly Company, sent me and Lefty lead barbell eyes that were poured out of mold made with bead chain. Okay. And when I seen the eyes, and I told Lefty about this fly, and he looked at me, and I looked at him, and Bobby, I bet you I know what you're going to do with these. I said, mm. you bet. <laughs> and and uh, But we, we had trouble with the first eyes. They were poured by bead chain, and the bar was too light, and we would break the eyes off and stuff like that. And over time, uh, uh, Tom at uh, Wapsy took care of that by – making actually drill molds to pour the the uh, lead eyes and stuff like that yep so <clears throat> i i put them on a hook where i used to stick a water gremlin split shot i tied them on the hook and put some bucktail together and a good friend of mine who has passed away since then uh john lowell and uh, my son bobby jr uh, we took these flies to the river and with the weight of the eye, and, and we, we are eight-rate rod men, we use rods that have eight-weight lines on, could cast these flies like they had no weight. Okay. Okay, we could cast them on the, spinning, on the fly rod. And we took them out, <laughs> and at that time, the Susquehanna River was in a good, good pure shape. Today, it's pretty polluted. Uh, we caught one bass on every cast for two straight hours Wow! on these fly patterns. That's incredible. Uh, I came home and called Lefty, and I said, Lefty, we got something up here, and I don't know what even to call this thing. No kidding. So he came up. He, he, he came up with one of the uh, Maryland Fly Club guys, and they went out and fished. And when they stopped in my shop to get these flies, I dumped them in Lefty's hand, and Lefty <laughs> says, Bobby, are they done? I said, yes, they're done. Don't put no more stuff on the hook, okay? So they took them out. 
And I usually had some spare time that late afternoon. And I said, look, I'll meet you guys on the river around 3 o'clock. Right. So I run down and get into my boat. And I see their boat. They're drifting down along the York County shoreline. And I come up to the boat and left. They had a red and white hackle fly on. And I said, how are you doing? And he said, I think you're doing a lot better than I am. And I said, what do you mean by that? And here the guy from Maryland had the biggest smile on his face <laughs> he've ever had. He said, Bob, I want to thank you. I caught, out caught Lefty Cray 10 best <laughs> to 1 because we're testing your fly. Incredible. Lefty has went through his whole fly box. And every... Tenth fish, he would get one, and this guy had ten fish. That's incredible. And and uh, I knew it was going to happen like right. that because we tried them first. And when they come come home and they come back in the shop, and Lefty says, "What are you going to call this?" I said, "I have no idea what to call this thing." He said, "Okay, it's tied by Clouser, and it goes deep and acts like an escaping minnow. We're going to call it the Clouser Deep Minnow." He said. Lefty named the fly. Lefty named the fly. I didn't know that. Yes. Lefty named the fly for me. What year was this, Bob? Uh, 1984, and we published it in 1985. Now, what do you mean by published? I uh, wrote it up in the fishing magazines, a fly fisherman magazine. So that was what it was to publish a fly at the time, was just to go in a magazine. Yeah. Where today you're going to submit it to like a fly company, and they're going to reproduce it. <coughs> yeah, thing. yeah. That's yeah. kind of like. Yeah. Fly design today. Yes. Uh, but this this was brought Public. out. And, and then, we, we of course, I, I, I wrote a couple of books. I wrote a fly tying book on those type of flies yeah, and yeah. things like that. But uh, Clouser Flies? or but uh, Yeah, Clouser Flies book. Yeah. But Lefty took those flies. And within, uh, within two and a half years, he has caught... 85 species of fish on them fly. Well, that's what I was just telling you, and I, I know you're so humble about it, but I'm guessing the Clouser minnow has caught more fish on a fly than any fly in history. It, I, it's caught me more fish on the same <laughs> fly than any that's, fly I've ever used. That's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. Well, the Clouser minnow. So some of the questions that I want to kind of pull out of you here is like, uh, you said that was created for a need. You were there in... The Susquehanna it, it, in Pennsylvania. I wanted to catch smallmouth bass on the fly rod and not my spinning rod. So that's the thing. There's so many people understand the clouds of minnow to be a striper fly. Oh, it's it's everything. It is a striper fly for sure, but yeah. that's they understand, hey, I'm yeah. going striper yeah. fishing. I need to get some clouds or minnows. Yeah. But that wasn't how it was originally designed. It was designed yeah. as a smallmouth fly. I, I just the men, uh, yeah, uh, but it's the same thing you're talking about. I just met a fellow that went to Australia. Okay. And the fellow's part of the TFO group and the Renzetti group. And he, he called me and he said, Bob, what color would you use in salt water? And I said, either white or chartreuse and white, my two favorite colors. White on white, huh? Yeah. Oh, yes. White and white with some good flash in the middle, different colors of, of fish or flash mixed together. But uh, so he called the camp, okay, the, where he was going. And he said uh, to the owner of camp, he said, I'm going I'm to tie a bunch of flies. What should I bring? He said, leave everything at home except the Clousers. That's incredible. He tied four dozen Clouser minnows. And, of course, he gave them all away while he was over there because they wouldn't let him go home without them. <laughs> they had to leave them there. You can take them, but you just can't <laughs> yeah, take them home. That's right. Yeah, you can have them, but you can't, you can't have them back. And he said every, every fish that they caught in that, on that week was caught in the clouds or fly. Do you remember what they were fishing for? What type of species? Uh, I salt. You had, yeah, all salt water. All salt. Uh, there's there's a salmon type species over there. There's yeah. Barramundi. Barram okay, yeah. Uh, and a few other. Uh, That's amazing. Fish, yeah. That's really cool. So, but anyhow, they had a successful time with them. <laughs> now, 1984. I understand you had a fly shop back in the day and. Yeah, I I opened the fly shop, uh, Three Mile Island. We were going to open in 1979, I guess it was. And Three Mile Island went haywire, you know, mm -hmm. back in them years. And uh, so we, we left it go for a year. We opened it in 1980, the fly shop. 
And was that kind of when you started to get involved in fly fishing? Or oh, had you been no, fly fishing your no. Whole life? I was involved since I was 14 years old. Oh, we're going to have to hear about that story, but let's continue. Okay, okay. so. The fly shop. Yeah, so I opened up the fly shop, and of course, our famous words were when customers would walk in, uh, is the river all right? Did Three Mile Island ever hurt the river? And yeah. I, I said, no, it made our night fishing much better because now we can see the glowing fish. <laughs> Tell our <laughs> listeners about Three Mile Island. That is like the fracking, or what was that? No, it, it's a power. Uh, the, oh, the nuclear, nuclear plant. Nuclear power plant, yeah. There was, uh, I don't know what happened, but there was one of the main heaters in there overheated and what they were afraid it was going to have a meltdown and mm. stuff and uh, uh we actually did evacuate because the guys that shopped and worked down there shopped there said bob don't go until we call you mm-hmm. okay and because people were leaving the area so i thought well i'm going to close up for a couple of days go on vacation uh, the guy called me and said, if you want to leave now, go ahead. But everything is fine and under control. So we just went on a, a week's vacation, and we drove like 50 miles away. Yeah. And 50 miles didn't mean nothing. when that, If that thing went off, it would have been 500 miles square area. Yeah. Ruined, you know. Yep. So, But anyhow, that's that's a way in the past, and everything's cured up since then. So, so the, what made you decide to start a fly shop? Uh, well, I was a, a butcher for Acme Markets. Uh, I made a career out of it. I started at 16 years old. No kidding. And, uh, butcher was, was, yeah, was, was with the company. I started grocery and produce and meat and I ended up being a a meat apprentice Mm -hmm. and I learned how to cut meat and I loved it. And I, I became from, you know, a nobody on up to a manager Yeah, and, uh, but I was getting some bad things. I would have, a, I had a bad back from lifting heavy pieces of meat. Uh, I had arthritis in both shoulders, and I had carpal tunnel from working so hard with knives in both hands. And uh, I just uh, decided to the company was going to build one store. We had 13 stores in our area, and uh, they were all antiquated stores. And they decided they're going to close the territory and build a big store in Philadelphia. And, uh, and of course, the boss came to me and said, Bob, he said, we can buy you a home in Philadelphia and sell your property. And you can manage the meat department down there. And his name was Mr. Frank Hearn. Okay. And I said, Mr. Hearn, there's no smallmouth bass in Philadelphia. I'm not going. <laughs> So I you was, knew it was time to make some changes. I was uh, 39 years old at the time. Okay. And we had two years to to get things going, and my son and I got together, and we built the fly shop on the side of my house. Oh, wow. So we built it, stocked it up full, and in uh, uh, 1980, opened it up, and I've been there ever since. Is it still there? Uh, no. I cl- okay. I closed it. Uh, we closed it because of my age, my wife's health. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to fish more. It's it's a lifetime job when yeah. you own your you, own yeah, business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Twenty four hours a day. Yeah. So there you are. It's in the early eighties, and you have this fly shop, and uh, that. So that's really what tra- helped you transition is just being yeah. a butcher for you were a butcher all the way from sixteen all the way to thirty nine, forty years old. Yes. Yes. And you said, you know, I need to make a change. I was actually 42 when it was all done when I quit Butcher. Amazing. Yeah. And you went into the fly business. Yes. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And so how did you meet Lefty? Uh, on the Susquehanna River my, where he would come and fish. I, you know, it, it was one of the only guys out there with a fly rod, and so was I. So we started talking to each other. And you met him on the river? Oh, God, yes. Way back. I mean, uh I'm I'm 81, and, and I think I knew Lefty way over 50 years. So you just yeah. a guy walking down. You just bumped into him. Was yeah. Just another dude yeah. that no, was on I the. No, I seen a guy in a boat fly yeah. casting. Oh, he was fly casting he, in the boat. He would bring his boat up from Maryland, put it in, put it in the river, and I would go out and here's a guy throwing 70, 80 feet, 100 feet of line, and I'm going like, man, I got to talk to that man. And we just became friends, and he actually helped me with my casting tremendous. 
Unbelievable. Tremendous. And we became friends. And I mean, personal friends, uh, friends that could give each other the devil and laugh about it. Yeah, right. You know, and have fun together. Sure. And I, I uh, started to travel with him. I, I went to Mexico, to Costa Rica, to Nicaragua. Uh, I caught my first tarpon ever down there in Costa Rica with him. Uh, stuff, I mean, we just became really good friends. I just think that's such an amazing story because, you know, so many times we're on the river and we bump into somebody and we get to be friends or you see yeah. him at the show. Yeah. And you become lifelong friends. And here yeah. you are. Yeah. You're just on the river fishing. And yeah. Lefty got his boat. He's casting a lot of line. And yeah. you said, I got to go talk to that and guy. I went over and talked to him. You bet. And then next thing you know, you get Lefty Cray and yeah. Bob Clouser. Yeah. Yeah. That is well. an incredible story. <laughs> well, I mean, it. it you know, uh, I just wanted to learn. And yeah. I learned so much off of that guy. And, and I'm sure he took some things from me well too, you learned so. a little bit about your fly i know yeah, that for yeah, sure yeah well he he was tremendous in that point he was a wonderful man uh so, so. yeah so you have the clouser minnow right mm -hmm. and then he had a famous fly yeah the deceiver the lefty's deceiver i took and put both of them together they were so good a fly that i i Wanted to do something for Lefty, so I, I just took the tails of the deceiver and tied it in the back of the Clouser minnow. And then you have the half and half, We right? called it a half and half, and it's become one of the most favorite used striper flies in the world. That's incredible. <laughs> so you get two friends yeah. who meet each other on the river. Yeah. They become friends. You have the Clouser minnow, you have the Lefty deceiver, and now you guys have your shared fly together. Yeah. The, the <laughs> half and half. That yeah. sounds like a great... Yeah. A great friendship that yeah. laughed a lifetime. Yeah. And, uh, I, I, you know, a lot of people think that we don't make mistakes, but we do. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you one. And okay. I, and I'm going to get this off of my mind. I actually took Lefty's hat off of his head with a cast. Oh, boy. I, he, we're in the boat. We're casting opposite ends. He says, Bobby, look at all them bass rising on that ledge out there. Turn around here and cast. I turned around and I hit his hat right here in the corner. <laughs> it went 20 feet out on the water. <laughs> the now famous lefty's hat is out now, there. <laughs> now listen. I just turned around and looked at him and I said, don't you say nothing. Look how far that hat went. <laughs> That's a good cast. Yeah. He didn't say anything. He just, no. he just laughed. You reeled it in, you stripped it in. Yeah, I stripped it in, dumped the water off of it, and here, put it back on your head. That's funny. <laughs> so I can use that story next time I you know, catch yeah. my buddy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> they say, hey, if Bob Klaus and Lefty Craig can catch each other, it's not yeah, bad if we do either. Uh, well, sometimes I'll catch myself in a tree, or, you know, yeah. and I'm like saying to myself, does Lefty Cray have these problems, or yeah, is it just we me? All, we all do. Okay. Uh, we used to have a little story together. When we goofed up a cast or did something and Lefty would go look at me, Bobby, people pay us to do this stuff. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> and, this is not bad. And we, we would just laugh about it, you know. But uh, your best thing that I can tell people that wants to get into this business is keep it fun. Yeah. Uh, get rid of the I did this, I did that stuff and start saying we did it. Mm -hmm. You know, or the customer with us accomplished this. Uh, a lot of articles written today and way back, uh, we always had a saying is that fella has eye trouble. Mm -hmm. I done this. I made the cast. I have never wrote one article like that. Right. It, it, and you got to be humble and you got to be just like the people you're talking to. And, and yeah, that, that's a good. It's a great thing tip right there. Yeah, it's a great tip. Yeah. Well, can we talk a little bit about for somebody who doesn't know what the Clouser Minnow has as materials? Can you just kind of run through that so they get an understanding? Yeah, it's <laughs> very, very less of everything. Yep. Uh, it's of course a hooks included, threads included to tie it. Uh, has a set of barbell lead eyes. Uh, you can do different weights. Uh, I want to get into that weight business a little bit more yep. for you here uh, for some good tips. Okay. Uh, it has uh, flash material and deer tail hair. Deer That's hair, it. yeah. That's it. So you get your hook. I mean, what, like a standard size uh, for like a smallmouth. At, at the time, 
that we were buying hooks. Uh, uh, we 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 used a ton of Mustad hooks, and the, and the number was three six six five uh, bass fly hook, standard length bass fly. In like a two or a four, or what? Uh, well, we you can tie that fly down to a size ten. Yep. And I'll tell you a little bit about small flies too, how good they are. Uh, and you can go up to five baud hooks with them. It depends on the long hair on the deer tail too. Okay. If, if it's long, real long, some maybe six inches long is a good buck. Uh, make you your fly six inches long. Uh, the smaller flies, uh, and I got into this big fly stuff two years ago. Uh, a smallmouth bass will eat pretty much anything its eye looks at. It doesn't measure its mouth. It'll eat whatever it wants. And we've caught numerous smallmouth on 6 to 10 inch long flies. Uh, I come down to Florida and I find out that uh, you can't catch much on the big flies down here. And uh, with the tarpon and the baby tarpon, we only use stuff 1 to, to 3 inches long. Okay. So you, the fly can be made in all various sizes yep. for just about Custom every it. species that's around. Uh, you heard of a fish called a cichlid, I'm sure. A cichlid. Like, uh, I call it a foreign sunfish. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, the fly, if it's one, one inch or one and a quarter inches, will catch every cichlid in there. Mm -hmm. Anything bigger, you'll get bites and not get hookups. Okay. Uh, so there again, the small flies, but the Clouser fly itself can be made in just about any size you want. Okay. And if you're making small Clousers, uh, it pays you to use calf tail hair. Now, when you cut a clump of calf tail hair off, you have to remove three quarters of the bundle. You hold the tips and you pull all them short hairs out of it. And now you have each of your hairs are pretty even, the long ones even if they're only an inch long, so you're using just guard hairs. Okay. And the same way like with fo red fox tails and that, don't use the whole cut. Uh, remove all the short hairs out of it. Mm -hmm. You can make your small flies very, like very that, effective yeah. like that, yeah. So you got uh, you get the mustad hook or any hook really that you prefer these days. Mm -hmm. uh, you have your deer hair or mm -hmm. your bucktail, right? It, yeah, I call it deer you hair. You call it, yeah, deer yeah, hair, bucktail. Because you... Doe hair is just as good as a bucktail, <laughs> so we call it deer tail hair. Deer tail hair, okay. Uh, and your colors? So uh, you, you, every color yeah. in that book seems to work on certain species, <clears throat> but again, uh, white and the chartreuse and white. And I have a favorite color when they don't produce, and I mix chartreuse and yellow together with gold in. Interesting. And that's a heck of a color. That, that saved my day a lot of times. And then you have the barbells. The, yeah. the, the yeah. eyes. Yeah. Now, let me get back to them. Uh, on my website, uh, anybody that's interested can get a chart. Okay. Uh, with the eye weight matching the fly line weight. Okay. In, in which, which weight of fly line likes the certain weight of the flies. And I, and I like talk to it, you know, or have the line talk to the plus customer. Right, right. And I start out like a, a five weight likes 180 and 150. Interesting. Hates the 130s and stuff like See, that. See, I didn't know any of this. Now, if you go up to a six weight, then you got the, the same two, and it almost likes the 130. The seven weight will almost like the 130. So you're still... If you go from five to seven, you got two eye weights that, that really can cast, okay, the 150, 180. If you go into an eight, now the eight weight loves all of them up into even the 130 weight. So now you can throw heavier flies. So it's really the the size of the rod that matches the barbell. No, no, the, the, oh, the vice versa. weight of the line. The weight of the line. It's The whole casting system is weight moving weight. Okay. Okay, so the five weight line is lighter than the eight, so the eight will pull more weight through the air. Your nine and ten weight rods will like all of the eye sizes. Mm -hmm. And we have that chart for them. Uh, 
available for on me. the website. What is that website? We'll tell you, uh, everyone again, and we'll put it in the show notes. But why don't we tell them? Clousersflyshop.com. There we go. Clousersflyshop.com. We'll get back to that. Okay, so we've covered the hook. We've covered the deer here or the bucktail. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've covered the barbells. Mm-hmm. What else is involved? The thread? Do you have a specific thread that you prefer to tie with the Clouser minnow, Bob? Yeah, there, there's today's market. There's a lot of good threads out there. Yeah, but my and again, this is just me. My personal use is the uni thread six aught. Okay, that six aught uni thread is that strong that you can spin deer hair with it. Okay, now you don't jerk when you tie stuff. You smooth weight and it won't break. Uh, and the Flymaster Plus for the large four aught and five eight. Odd hooks, and the reason I use the plus, I don't have to make as many wraps. Okay. The thinner threads, more wraps, but the thin thread, if if you learn to use it and use it on a lot of stuff, the thinner the thread, the tighter the fly stays together, and the more durable. Uh, and also, there's there's one little thing in in fly tying that I think is a misinformation. Okay. Uh, a lot of Teachers will tell you to cover the whole hook with th- tying thread. Maybe if you're making something smooth, it's probably necessary. But for holding materials tight on the hook and the deer hair and the squirrel hair don't pull out, it's best to put on the hook a, a palmer type or a screw type thread look. Okay. That way when you lay stuff on there, you're pinching the, the materials between them threads. And, and you can't pull them out. There's another pro tip. Yeah, and, and, and glue. And glue. Instant glue. Yeah. Do you have a preferred cement or glue that you like to use uh, for the clouser? Well, yeah, and it's, it's in a brush. It comes in a brush bottle from Wapsi Fly Company. Yeah. So the uh, Wapsi head cement or what would you call it? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, called... Z-Met. Oh, the Z-Met, the Wapsi Z-Met. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah. Won a, I won a bottle of it last night at the at D- the party. Don't drink it. You won't be able to get your lips open. <laughs> <laughs> no, it goes on the fly. Do you, yeah. use, uh, do you dab it with like a, uh, a bucket? It comes or? with a brush. A brush. You uh, brush it. And you and you brush it on, but don't use tons of it, you know. Lighter. A yeah. little bit of that stuff goes a long way. Well, and actually, actually, I've tested it and... Uh, Left things set for weeks and even used it, and you got to take a box cutter blade to get it off the hook. That's how durable that glue is. Yeah. Yeah. I think we covered all the materials, right? Did we miss anything? Uh, I don't think we missed anything. We got it all. The clouds are minnow right there. Yeah. And, well, I got to make you laugh here a little bit. When I opened up the shop, and I think I maybe did say this about... They asked me, where do you get the chartreuse deer tails? And I said, well, you got to buy them in a fly shop, but I can go down on Three Mile Island and hunt deer. They got already yeah. chartreuse. Yeah, <laughs> they're already chartreuse. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. Do you have a pref- uh, preferred uh, deer here or bucktail that you prefer? Is anything as good as the next? Do you have a vendor or a company that you like to I, use? I have, I have a fellow, and I buy some off of these guys here when I look them over, but uh, his name is Jack Mikovich, and Jack had a fly shop when I started. And Jack is one of the best material dyers in the world. And he dyes my collars, the special collars I want. Uh, I, I don't have to buy bucktails and look at them. He sends me nice stuff. Yeah. Uh, I got bucktail hair from two and a half inches to seven and a half. Unbelievable. Uh, off of tails. And uh, I stay, I'm still one of the old crew. I stay with the old buddies. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're a loyal yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. awesome. Yep. Yeah. And I guess I've been buying stuff from him ever since I opened back in the 80s. Well, some things you just don't need to change, right? No. You find your, your niche and you stay Hey, with I'm it. one of the guys that goes, hey, if it works, don't change it. Yeah. You know, if it's good, don't buy it. You know, if you got something that's good, don't go buying something else thinking it's better. Right. Because it's like a gun. Only the gun shoots straight. It's the guy behind it pulling the trigger that makes it go off the target. Right, so. right. <laughs> yeah. Why don't we just real quickly talk about the materials in the in lefties deceiver? Because I know we have the half and half, but why don't we go over to the lefties deceiver? Okay, now there's probably been 
all types of deceivers devised since his. Uh, but if you can get yourself a nice long hackle, uh, saddle hackle they're called, and some of them are between five to seven inches long. You're getting heckled. Speaking of hackle, you're getting heckled. <laughs> that, that's buzzy. He also sells good deer tails. Okay. But anyway, anyway, uh, the feather itself, if you want to select good saddle hackles, they can't be webby. Okay. Okay. It, ha it has to have the fresh spikes sticking off the stem. Uh, you can actually make uh, tails by taking and gluing the stem. If you can pick these feathers out, you take a little dot, uh, one of them liquid uh, fast drying yep. glues, mm -hmm. and just put it on the stem, and you glue the two stems together and tie it on like that so no glue gets on the fibers. Yeah. And you got yourself a fish shape and a tail right there. That's incredible. Just without without doing anything special to it. It's a great another pro tip. But you you got to look for the right feathers and stuff like that. Yeah. You, you got to be able to learn about materials and how they're going to work too when you use them. Uh, I got a uh, uh, good tip from Lefty when uh, Lefty never tied many flies. Okay, but when he did tie something, I went down to his place and see how he put it together. Yep. It's like his deceiver. When he went somewhere, he'd give me a call. Bobby, I need six deceivers. Do you have time? He always made sure I had time, but it still meant you better get them for him. <laughs> he was just being polite. <laughs> he was just being polite. So I went down to his house, and again, uh, that Norvice setting here uh, – was one of his favorite vices yeah. and we use them all renzetti it has a super set of vices yep. absolutely durable merchandise regal's got stuff griffin's got a lot of good stuff yep everybody has something good you just have to learn to use it yeah and lefty would sit there and he'd show me how and i never used the vice because i called it too complicated mm -hmm. but Show me how to put these flies together, and I, that's how I tied them for him when he went fishing. And and, that's and how long had you been tying at that point? Oh, I've been tying since I'm 14 years old. So when you say you never used a vice? I never used that oh, type. Oh, that of, type of vice. That okay, type yeah. of vice, the one that re really spins. The rotating, yeah. Yeah, I never used that because I don't like complicated things, <laughs> and you had to do all certain things. With that. I did it all by hand. But... Uh, uh, I use all all the I, yeah. I used every vice that was made, and they're all they all work. So, uh, what's the list of materials in the lefty deceiver? We, you know, obviously you talked about the saddle hackle. The, it's saddle hackles and deer hair and, deer. and flash if you want to put it in. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else in there. Uh, there's things that you can do with them. And, right. And uh, he liked red throats. I either took a red feather, put a throat on it with red feather, or yep. red crystal flash and made a throat. Yep. Out of that. And that's incredible. Then you, you just married them together and you made uh, the half and half. It's actually easier to make a deceiver than you think it is. Yeah. And, and that. But he never liked anything hard to build, and I don't either. I, Somebody had mentioned that you had talked about in the past. It's just where to put those dumbbell eyes on the clouds. It yeah. makes a huge difference. Some people tend to put them too far forward. Uh, most all of them put them too far forward. Most all the flies I see. What happens uh, if you use, you, you don't want the eyes to turn on the hook, okay? Mm -hmm. So when you take the head and you bind that thread right back to them eyes, you can't glue them fast to the hook. Right. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be tying you one here today, and I'll show you to leave a spot of, of opening between the back of the head, the thread head, and the eyes. Mm -hmm. And you'll have a little space in there. And when you use epoxy or this this new solar edge, yeah. Toby, you put it inside that eyes and it glues the whole set to the hook. Amazing. Before you'd have to like do like a 17,000, like. Well, eight, figure eight turns to get it to be yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah, but well, I, I, I use like a, a circle wrap, and I'll show you. But the glue, especially 30-minute Z-poxy, goes right into the hook, and, and the whole head is one unit. 
That's awesome. Yeah. That's cool. Otherwise, if you put the thread head clear back to the eyes, you can take and crank that around, and it'll, yeah. it'll become loose. Yeah. Well, for those uh, listening on our podcast, check out our YouTube channel, and you'll see uh, Bob's uh, tie that we're about to do. So yeah, we're going to do good. a closure today. So we're excited about that. Um, I want to go back to the beginning because you talked about how you started at the age of 14. How did that happen, Bob? How did you start at the fly fishing? Uh, that was all my dad's doing. Okay. Uh, Where did you grow up? In uh, Mid Middletown, Pennsylvania, a little burr called Royalton. Okay. We used to have a post office, and it was that small. That we went into the Middletown area post office. So sure. So I address. Uh, you can get me through Royalton or Middletown. Yeah. <laughs> address. Uh, but your the, dad was a fisherman? Oh, God, yes. Oh, yeah. My, and my dad is was a, an old hunter at that time. He fed the family off of the outdoors. Mm. Uh, we eat, eat a lot of fish and a lot of catfish. And, and you know, uh, my dad, my family was not a rich family with money we could throw around. Yeah. So during Christmases, he would buy, uh, there was four of us, and he would buy one gift for each of us. And one year I got a ba basketball, one year a football, you know, and one year a baseball bat. And I got to tell this story to my kids. Yeah. <laughs> and one and gift <laughs> one gift and uh i started to uh go over to a buddy's house that had a fly tying kit and started making these flies and i'd shown them my dad and my dad took them trout fishing and caught trout on them okay on oh, an wow. old bamboo fly rod what was your dad's name clarence clarence yeah, okay yeah and and uh so that one Christmas that I started to get interested, he bought me a, a fly tying kit, and the magazine came was a family circle magazine with the circle on the front. Yeah, yeah, I know it, yeah. And all the fly pictures were paintings, not pictures. Yeah. And I didn't know what a blue dun was. Blue dun looked like six different colors on these pictures. You sure. Know? But it, you learn after a while, and you learn how to construct a fly. So I started making flies, and, and, and about two years after that, uh, when I was ready to graduate, they wanted us to display something that we could build ourselves. Okay. And there's guys in there built stuff out of erector sets and battery-run automobiles and things like that. No one well, I knew was, was tie a fly. Yeah. So I went over to the 5 and 10 cent store, and I bought me four big white cardboard cards went into the hardware store and bought a bunch of thin wood lays tacked them all together pasted these cards on it and till i was done with all the fly patterns that i had out of the books and that i tied every fly pattern i could find incredible and i uh, took a piece of plastic and scotch taped them to the board wrote the names on them and and submitted them for like a project. For a project. I actually got an honorable mention out of that. Good for you. That's an incredible story. Just from a, a present your dad bought you at Christmas. Yeah, just from what they bought. for, And I've been at it ever since. And, uh, and trying to take the flies that would work somewhat and try to make them better. Improve and, them. And things like that. And improve them or develop new, new patterns. What I thought they would like. And uh, I... My development of flies comes not from the looks of a fly, but from how you can fish it and what it does while you're fishing it. And I found out with weighted flies and even nymphs for trout, they have the movement of everything that is trying to escape from being eaten by the predator. Flies that just hang there, and you got to tease them a little bit. They'll catch fish, but they don't put numbers in the boat that what the mm -hmm. weighted stuff does. Because uh, actually, uh, actually, I can say this: a weighted fly never stops moving, even during the retrieve mm -hmm. and the pause. Because it's got a little that motion, yeah. that jiggy yeah, motion. Never yeah. stops moving. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> to add a little bit of humor to this. Uh, Lefty and I are sitting down on Chesapeake Bay, and we're testing weighted flies and unweighted flies on feeding stripers. Yeah. And throw a deceiver in there, and we get two or three swirls in back of it, you know. 
throw a half and half in there and get one fish on every cast. Throw a clouser minnow in there and get one fish on every cast. Throw the deceiver in there and catch one on maybe every five casts. And he goes, Bob, this is, Bobby, he only called me Bobby. He said, this is pretty simple to figure out. He said, just think if you were a striper and you were two or three years old and you're chasing this piece of bait and it stops and says, go ahead and eat me. Would you eat that? <laughs> exactly. Because they never stop and turn around and say, go ahead and eat me. So the fly never stops moving is the key to that fly. Can I tell you a quick story? Yeah. See this brown trout right behind us here? Oh, that, yeah. That nine-pound brown trout? I caught that in Iceland. And you want to know? That was the second cast I took to him because the story that you just told it was behind a weed bank, and I cast it to the weed bank. I strip, 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 and I saw this monster brown coming from the weed bank to attack this fly. And I was getting close and close, and I wanted him to eat it. So you what did I did? I you stopped. stopped it. And he turned around, he went back to the weed bank as soon exactly. as I stopped it. Yeah. I said, oh, no, I don't know if I'm going to get another shot at him. So I cast it back to the weed bank. I stripped, 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 stripped. He kept coming, he kept coming, and I didn't stop stripping, and he attacked it. Yes, yes. That's the whole thing. That's the whole you gotta thing. you got to keep stripping. <laughs> if you're fishing a minnow, don't stop it and let it hang there. I know. I watched a spin fisherman on Clark's Creek in Pennsylvania stand in a riffle. And out catch the guys with the fly rods, one trout after the other, by casting upstream with a live minnow on and reeling it just a little faster than the current coming down. Oh, I said, there's a tip. I'm going to fish my clouser like that. Mm -hmm. So I learned after a couple of failures, I would learn to, to judge the speed of the current, throw the fly dead straight up in that current and get my speed stripping speed a fa little faster than that current i caught one trout after the other that's incredible just by ne by making it look like the real thing trying yeah. to hide yeah yeah it, it, it's it's incredible i know you're part of the tfo program and so mm -hmm. that was a program that lefty stood behind too and one oh, of the yeah. things that i uh i valued that lefty talked about with uh, temple fork is that he wanted to represent a rod uh, that was a quality rod, but also a rod that uh, somebody could get into the sport with without having to break the bank. Yeah, yes. Why don't you talk a little bit about your relationship with TFO? Uh, well, it's been wonderful. Uh, it's been wonderful. The prices of, of cost things have gone up a little bit. Uh, they actually made build a rod for me to throw the weighted flies. And they, okay. They call it a clouser, and it's a super rod. Very easy to cast, uh, very easy to throw weight with. Uh, it's not a real fast, stiff rod, which mm -hmm. you don't want when you're throwing weighted flies. You want a rod that's got forgiveness to it. Yep. And uh, actually finding lines today for those rods, uh, you're, you're very capable to find a good match in most, yeah. most line manufacturers. Uh, they have been a great promoter in growing what we tried to do way back is to grow the business with young people. And if you don't have new people coming into the fly business, you're going to go out of business because the guys that are in it for three, four years have everything they need. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe once in a while they'll buy a new item. that's brand new. Sure. But the new fly tire spends a lot of money. Yep. And, and Lefty and I all the years have encouraged that. Uh, when Lefty and I were with other companies, him and I sold more Cortland fly rods yeah. and more St. Croix fly rods than any two men on this earth. Yep. As, yeah, it's be a great product to start with. Be because we sold them introduction items mm -hmm. that our companies didn't have. Mm -hmm. And when they get into that, and my shop was a good teller of that when I sold them a Cortland. And they got into it and liked it. Two years later, they bought a $500 fly rod. Sure, yeah. Well, that fish right there was caught with a TFO, Temple mm -hmm. Fork out for the rod, mm -hmm. a nine weight, because we were fishing the big lake. So I wanted yeah. to be sure there was just that fish and bigger in yeah. there. So Yeah, well, yeah. In Iceland. Yeah, yeah. You, uh, there's different line weights for different size flies, but there's also different line weights, rod weights for different size fish, too. Sure. Yeah. 
Why don't we close? Before we close, I want to hear you had mentioned that you and Lefty used to travel together. Oh, God damn. I want to know about a story or two about some of your travels that would kind of represent some of the humor that you and Lefty would have on your travels or <laughs> something that our listeners would well, be humored we, about. Well, we, we, uh, one big humor thing that i never forget was that we're going, uh, we were in Costa Rica and we're throwing big popping bugs to the brush. And I started to brag. Look, look at that hey, boy from Pennsylvania putting that in that hole, you know. Yeah. And then I get the fly caught in the bush. <laughs> He'd say, you better shut up, Clouser. You're going to get in trouble. Oh, goodness. And I'd go for a while, and I'd brag again, and I'd get the fly caught in the brush. Well, we got the fly caught. The bug was caught up in the brush. And the guy pushed us in. And I'm up on the front of the boat, and Lefty's sitting on the chair right in back of me. And I stick my arm up on that limb. And a caiman, about a four-foot-long caiman, came off the limb, hit me on the shoulder, got lefty right in the lap, and went out overside the boat. Oh, no. And I turned I said, what the hell was that? You're going to have us eaten, he said, alive. <laughs> he said, that was a big alligator come off of there. <laughs> I said, he wasn't that big. He couldn't have bit much. Yeah. But that, uh, and the lefty's eyes were that big around, you know, looking, and it, it all happens in an instant, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. And here, I guess, this Cayman was laying up there in the sun and came out of there one day. Wait for the, the kid from Pennsylvania <laughs> to come get his fly <laughs> yeah. stuck in a tree. I go like that, and here he go, whack, hit me on his shoulder and down on his lap and out over the side of the boat, and in an instant, it was all over. Well, that's phenomenal. But he won't. He wouldn't let me ever forget that. He's Tyler's trying to get us killed down here in this jungle. You know, <laughs> these big alligators and came. <laughs> what are, this is a little thing. Do you have a favorite species? I know you started with the smallmouth. You st is it still your favorite, or what, uh, do you, what are you doing these days? I know you're down in Florida some. Yeah, and yeah. I I like everything that eats a fly. Uh, but uh, I would love to go back to Pennsylvania and spend my last days on the river. The way it was when I fished it. Susquehanna. But I don't think today with the population and all the other things going on that that's going to ever, yeah. ever happen. Uh, that Susquehanna River when I was a kid was a playground for all of us guys living at it. Uh, it had sparkling water. Yep. It had so many different fly hatches all over it. It had uh, probably 10 or 12 different species of fish that you could catch on flies. It was a tremendous resource. Yeah. And today, the smallmouth bass are in very bad trouble in there. All the panfish are gone. Uh, the big, uh, the big ch chubs and the big fall fish we used to catch are no longer there. Uh, I remember trapping, and I did a lot of trapping too when I was a kid, in these runs uh, where this spring we would go check stuff, and you couldn't take one step without tramping on a black sucker mm -hmm. the run was full of fish breeding there's nothing in them anymore yeah. there's not even muskrats there mm. so uh we're we're slowly just tearing away the whole environment and yeah something definitely has to be done uh right now there's chemicals out there that are killing people yep and they have to be stopped and they're getting in the rivers well, anything on the ground goes yeah. into the water. It's a runoffs. Don't matter where you put it, it en ends up there. Yep. It ends up in the water. Yeah. Well, it's been an honor to have you on, Bob. It's been my pleasure to have you on. How can our listeners and viewers find out more? You said clouserflyshop.com? Yes. Clouserflyshop.com. You can find out more about all there, the. There's a lot of information on there. Uh, the lady that takes care of my, my business there, Jackie Proc has put uh, the, uh, all my old articles. I must have wrote a couple hundred articles way back, okay, and I yeah. saved them, and yeah. she, she publishes them. Hoping, we're doing that hoping that it'll help somebody get into the sport and, yeah. really, and really keep it going. You had met uh, Brandon Miller, yes. the young TFO oh, yeah. ambassador. That's, that's the kind of people we're looking for. Yeah, he is a great young man, and he's doing great work with the yeah. flies. and. Yeah. Attach himself to Blaine Chocolate. He loves oh, Blaine. Yeah. Oh God, yes. He loves oh, going yeah. fishing. He caught a big mus, a uh, big uh, musky with Blaine. Yeah, I seen the photograph. Yeah. It's gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, good, good young. Yeah, and nice the boy's kid. smiling from ear to ear. Yeah, he's a great, <laughs> great young man. So yeah, you bet. He's a TFO guy and a Norvice yeah. guy too. Yeah. So, yes, indeed. Yeah. You bet. 
ties good flies. Well, Bob, it's been our pleasure to have you on the podcast. We're going to now tie a Clouser minnow. You're going to make me do that. <laughs> you don't mind, do you? No, no problem. Bob, thanks for being on our show. Yeah. Pleasure.